30 years ago, last year, I began full-time preaching out in a little country church in Montgomery County, Kentucky. Uh, that's where some of Jackson's folks are from. In the year after that, my second year of preaching, I was eating lunch one day and reading the big major newspaper in central Kentucky, and I saw an op-ed that was written by a professor of philosophy and religion at Eastern Kentucky State University, who was also a Baptist minister. The purpose of his op-ed was to complain about a decision that the major Southern Baptist seminary in the country, which is located in Louisville, had recently made. The seminary had decided to insist upon a more conservative view of scripture. And that if you were a faculty member and you did not believe that the Bible was the true word of God, then you would no longer have a place to work. Well, he was upset about this. And he wrote this op-ed complaining that that turns the Bible into an idol. He called it bibliolatry. And when I read that, I thought, you know, first of all, just historically, that's what most believers in Christ have believed, that the Bible is the true word of God. And more than that, it's what Jesus himself taught. So I decided to write a letter to the editor and essentially say that. Well, a few days later, I was in my study way out in the country. This is like seven and a half miles out from a small town. But somehow, someone who works for the local CBS affiliate in Lexington, WKYT, home of the Wildcats, got my phone number and called me and said, uh, Mr. Scott, yes, I'm, my name is John Townsend, and I host a TV show on WKYT. I saw your letter to the editor, and I saw this professor's op-ed, and I would like to have you all on my show to debate the issue. Oh, and we're recording tonight. So I said to him, well, sir, first of all, I'm like 23 years old, and I'm not even out of grad school, and I'm not even a Baptist. Surely you can find somebody who will defend the truth of the Bible on, on this debate. And he said, I've tried like 20 people. Nobody will do it. If you don't do it, it'll just be an interview. So I said, well, I gotta pray about this. So I asked him to call me back in a few hours. So I prayed a lot, and I called several of my mentors, like Marty, and talked to them about whether or not to do this. And when he called back, I told him that I would agree to do this. And I have to be honest, one of the main reasons I agreed to do this is he told me that the show was going to air on 6.30 in the morning on Saturday. And I figured if I really blew it, nobody would see it anyway. So, you know, there wasn't much to lose here. So later that afternoon, I prepared as best I could. One of my good friends who preached in my hometown I called him and told him. So we got together, and we came up with a list of possible questions that would come up. And then he started quizzing me, and I started practicing answers. And then we drove over to WKYT Studios, and I met this professor who was like right out of central casting. He had on like the tweed jacket with the leather patches, you know, on the elbow, all that. I don't think he was smoking a pipe, but he, he, he probably does. So we go in and we sit down, and all of a sudden this theme music starts, and I can see a teleprompter, and the host is introducing us, and my heart is just pounding. But I did happen to glance over. I, I guess I've kind of done this for my old uh, debate days. I, would look at, I looked at his hands, and I noticed his hands were shaking. And I thought, well, if this guy, who's a big shot, if he can be nervous, well, I guess it's okay for me to be nervous as well. But anyway, so the host introduced us. Dr. Miller, what is your view of the Bible? And he said, the Bible is the church's book. Always has been, always will be. In other words, we determine what the Bible is rather than the Bible determining what we're supposed to be. And I like panicked. I froze. I thought, what am I going to say? And I'm sitting there just totally stymied. And all of a sudden, I heard the director say, cut. And the film in the camera had broken. <laughs> 
So they had to redo all that. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what am I going to say? So music starts, teleprompter, introduction, Dr. Miller, the Bible is the church's book, always has been, and I'm still just totally drawing a blank. And then cut, his microphone fell off. And at some point between them getting the microphone on and the theme music starting, I figured out what I would say. So then I started, please ask him the same question and answer it the same way. And then, so he did, and then we were kind of off and running, and then uh, we were supposed to tape one show, 30 minutes, but the discussion was such good give and take that uh, we ended up taping a couple of episodes. And then I found out, apparently, a lot of people watch TV at 6.30 on Saturday morning. Because, like, my bank teller said, hey, I saw you on TV. And my old uh, high school, social, uh, junior high social studies teacher saw me in a game and told me he saw it. So it was quite an experience for a young preacher in his second year of full-time preaching. And it taught me a couple of things. One is that prayer works. Because, I mean, I prayed uh, very hard to prepare for that. But the other thing it taught me is how much the religious landscape was changing. It it was not at all unheard of generations ago for people of different religious convictions to have debates. But those debates were about what the Bible says on some topic, like baptism or the security of the believer. This was a debate about what the Bible is. And of course, in the last 30 years since that encounter, confidence and reverence in the word of God has only decreased in our country. So that's one of the reasons that I wanted to talk with you in this mini-series about Jesus in the Bible, because I think it is vitally important for us to anchor what we believe about the Bible into our commitment to Jesus Christ himself. Last week, I talked with you about the subject of truth, what Jesus said about truth. That was the foundational lesson. And what I'd like to do this morning is talk with you about some of the things I mentioned in that debate 30 years ago. If we follow Jesus, what does Jesus say about the scriptures? And I want to begin by asking you to turn with me this morning to the Gospel of Mark, to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7 contains an encounter between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees on the issue of tradition, particularly in this case, the tradition of how to properly wash your hands before you eat. Verse 5, the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Now, I'm a big believer in washing your hands before you eat. I'm a big believer especially in washing hands before you cook the food that I'm going to eat. I mean, last night, the Gregory's had me over for lasagna, and Mackenzie and Cammy made the lasagna, and they washed their hands. Right? <laughs> and then we ate. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of that. But when you make that a test of religious purity, that's a different matter. And so in verse 6, he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. Now, what I want you to notice here in the next few verses is how carefully and clearly the Lord distinguishes what is the word of man versus the word of God. Look at verse 9. He said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained for me is Corban that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down, and many such things you do. We know in the Old Testament, there are references to making vows, but there's no specific requirement as to when or how much. What Jesus is referring to here, though, is a tradition that had developed about making certain vows for certain amounts. And what he's saying is, you've put so much emphasis on your tradition that people don't actually have money to do what the law says they're supposed to do, namely, take care of their parents, which is a part of what it means to honor your father and mother. 
As Jesus makes this point, notice, first of all, that he's very clear about what is the word or commandment of God. He says in verse 8, you leave the commandment of God. In verse 9, you are rejecting the commandment of God. In verse 13, you're making void the word of God. But notice, what is the word of God Jesus is talking about? Look at verse 10. Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. Two quotes from the book of Exodus, which Moses wrote. But what Jesus is saying here is, although Moses wrote the book of Exodus, it is ultimately not the word of Moses. It's the word of God, and it's that word of God penned by Moses, which you are rejecting by your tradition, which in contrast to the word of God is verse seven, the commandment of men. Verse eight, the tradition of men. Verse nine, your tradition. Verse 11, what you say. Verse 13, your tradition. So you see, Jesus is acknowledging there were human authors of the books of the Old Testament. But what Moses and what David and what Isaiah wrote were ultimately more than the word of just men. They were the word of God in contrast to what is just the word of men. And by the way, I thought Chase beautifully prayed this morning about the great gift of what God has given to us in his word. All right, now then, let's go from here to our scripture reading, which is in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. In the context, the key verse here is verse 20, which is the theme of the Sermon on the Mount. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees had a very superficial level of righteousness. You shall not commit adultery. Jesus says the level God wants is your heart. I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery in his heart. So while Jesus is looking for what is deeper than the superficial meaning of the law, he does not for a second undermine the law. Instead, verse 17, do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. When Jesus talks about what in the ESV is translated an iota or dot are the smallest letters and marks of the Hebrew alphabet, which I know you all know, but just for review, here it is once again. And I have circled for you the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter yod. In Greek, it would be yoda. In English, it would be I. Smallest letter. And then the smallest stroke would be one of those tiny marks that extend, that distinguish one letter from another, like the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I. And what Jesus is saying here is that the smallest letter or stroke carries the authority of the word of God. It's not just in the books. It's not just even in the words. It's not just even in the letters. It is down to the very strokes of the letters. And because it is all from God, as he says here in verse 18, all must be accomplished. Which brings me to our second point. Because the Old Testament is the word of God, the Old Testament is true. And since it is true, what it says and what it predicts must take place. Let me show you another place where Jesus says the same thing. Would you look with me at the end of Luke's gospel, over in Luke chapter 24? Luke chapter 24. When I was growing up, the Bible class workbooks that we used often had this picture in the back. Does that look familiar? Any of y'all seen that kind of picture? And it's like a bookcase and it shows the sections of the books of the Bible. And like in the Old Testament, a shelf for the, the books of the law and then the books of history and then poetry and prophecy. Well, Jesus' Bible, the Jewish Bible, also had a, a division of sections, the same books, but organized differently. And you can see him refer to this here in verse 44. Thus, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. This is their bookcase, 
they had one section called the law, which is what we call the law, and then they had a section they called the prophets, which included not only Isaiah and Jeremiah, but also books like Samuel and Kings, because they believed the prophets not only told about the future that was about to take place, but also explained the future that had already occurred. And then they had a third section they called the writings, the first and largest book of which was the Psalms. Law, Moses, prophets, and Psalms. That's this arrangement here. Uh, the law is called the Torah, T, and the prophets is called the Nevi'im, N, and the writings is called the Kethuvim, K, and when you take the first letters of each of those terms, you make the word Tanakh. So if you go to a bookstore and you go to the Judaica section, that's what the Jewish scriptures are called. The key thing is, it's the same material as in our Bibles, just organized differently. Really, the only other difference is they counted them differently. Instead of our 39 books, they counted them as either 22 or 24. Uh, one of the things they did is the 12 minor prophets are just the 12, which would have made learning them much easier if we could have just called them the 12 and not have to work between Haggai and Habakkuk and all the rest of that. And then they would combine books like Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, and then sometimes they would append Ruth to Judges and Lamentations to Jeremiah. But Jesus is referring to what we would know of as the Old Testament. The thing that I want you to see here is what he says in verse 44, that everything must be fulfilled in the law of the prophets and the writings. Everything must happen. A lot of us here play uh, fantasy football and... Uh, when we play fantasy football, each week we have a showdown. Today I'm taking on my good brother Justin Bartlett in fantasy football. And each week, Yahoo tells you who is predicted to win. I think I've been predicted to win every game. I have not won every game because Yahoo is not infallibly true. It often gets it wrong. But if there's any justice in the world today, it will be absolutely correct. But anyway, what it says doesn't have to be true. But because the Old Testament is the word of God, everything it says must be fulfilled because it is the word that comes from God. And then just to emphasize this point, look with me over in John 10 at another classic statement by our Lord about the truthfulness of the scriptures of the Old Testament. John chapter 10. This is a testy encounter, as they often are, between Jesus and the Jewish rulers about the nature of Jesus' identity as the Son of God. In verse 33, you can see that they want to stone him for blasphemy, for his claims. Jesus defends himself like this in verse 34. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, quote, I said you are gods, end quote. Has that ever been your memory verse? It's a pretty obscure passage. It comes from the book of Psalms. Nobody's sure what the psalm is referring to as gods. Is it Israel's judges serving as representatives of God? Is it the false gods of the nations? But here's the point that Jesus is making, which is actually pretty clear to see. It's what you might call an argument from the lesser to the greater. If you have no problem with the scripture referring to these, whoever, as gods, then how could you object to me calling myself the son of God, who is truly the sanctified son of God? All right, so that's the basic argument. What I want you to see is this little statement Jesus makes in the end of verse 35 when after quoting the scripture in this debate, he says, and scripture cannot be broken. Scripture is not like, like in sports. You know, there's athletes who have contracts. They're gonna play for a certain team for a certain amount of time, for a certain amount of money, but they can always find a way to break those contracts. You can get out of those. Jesus says, you're not breaking the word of God. You cannot get out of the authority of the word of God. Its authority is unbreakable. And so in, in the course of a debate, once you quote scripture, because scripture is true, that's the end of the debate, which is why Jesus is making the point here that he is making. 
And think about it. Jesus is making that comment, the scripture cannot be broken, with reference to a verse that everybody agrees is obscure and would certainly be at the periphery of what we know of from the Psalms. But even that passage, peripheral though it may be, obscure though it may be, is the unbreakable word of God. But we have one more point. Not only is the Old Testament the word of God and therefore true, the Old Testament itself says that there will come a future age in which its promises will be fulfilled by something and someone better. And so here's the third important thing to see, that the Old Testament is not God's final word. I'm gonna make reference to two passages that I think are pretty well known here. The first of these is in Matthew chapter 19, when the scribes and Pharisees come to try to trick Jesus and test him with an issue controversial in their day and controversial in our day. They have a question about divorce. The question is, can a man divorce his wife for any cause? Verse three. Notice that when Jesus answers them, what does he point them to? Have you not read? Scripture is gonna give us an authoritative answer that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and then he quotes two passages from Genesis, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, the two shall become one flesh, so they're no longer two but one flesh, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they say, well, wait a minute. Isn't there some passage in Deuteronomy written by Moses that gives instructions for the proper procedure for how to divorce? And Jesus says, yes. Yes, there is. But he also says this. That regulation was given not to indicate approval of a practice that is good, but to regulate and limit a practice that is bad. But the Lord did so knowing that you have what kind of heart? Knowing the hardness of your heart. But then what does Jesus say in verse 9? And I say to you, I know what Moses permitted, but what Moses said is not the last word on this subject. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. What Moses said was true and it was the word of God, but it was not the final word of God on this matter. And in fact, I think we ought to make this point here as well. When I was a little kid, I had this impression that the law is hard and and, and rigorous and strict. And then Jesus kind of comes and it's going to be easier and lighter. When you compare what Moses permitted to what Jesus says is the case, is Jesus moving in the direction of what is permissive or is he moving in a more strict direction? He's moving in a more strict direction. He's actually holding them to the standard that God had originally intended, but the hardness of heart prevented because Jesus can come and deal with hardness of heart so we can then do what God all along intended. I just want you to see here that this is an easy example to see where our Lord says, although the Old Testament is the true word of God, it was not gonna be the final answer. And then the other story which I preached about earlier this year when racial matters were exploding, and I talked with you about the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman in John 4. You know this story really well. After Jesus opens the closet door to every skeleton of her life, she says, hey, you're a prophet, aren't you? No, duh. She goes, I got a question for you. I'm a Samaritan, you're Jewish. Samaritans, we think Mount Gerizim is the holy mountain. Jews, you say Zion, Jerusalem, is the holy mountain. Which is it? And Jesus answers her in two ways. In verse 22, he says, you're wrong, we're right. Because as I said last week, Jesus believed in truth, in a standard of right and wrong that applies to everybody. But he also says this, this is in verse 21. An hour is coming in which neither this mountain nor in Jerusalem do you have to worship. 
Now, I read that passage a long time before I thought through its implications about the Old Covenant. Did the Old Covenant have anything to say about where you're supposed to worship? It has a lot to say. Deuteronomy is filled with uh, instruction that when you go into the promised land, God is going to place his name, and there's going to be one central place of worship. In fact, that's when a lot of things go wrong in the history of Israel, when they try to set up other sanctuaries of worship other than the one central one that God intended for them to have. And then eventually, of course, it's going to be Mount Zion in the city of Jerusalem. It is unquestionable that that is what the Old Covenant said. All right, now think about this. If the Old Covenant was insistent that there was a central place of worship, that is Jerusalem, but Jesus says there is an hour coming in which the place no longer matters, what does that imply about the Old Covenant? It is no longer going to be that which regulates and guides the life and worship of God's people. By saying that an hour is coming in which the location of a sanctuary no longer matters, Jesus is implicitly teaching what the Old Testament itself explicitly says. The true word of God in Jeremiah, for example, that we just read this week says, Behold, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. You might say that the Old Covenant was marked by planned obsolescence. You know what that is, right? Like uh, your iPhone charger. That's plan Those things last like three minutes, and then you got to always get a replacement. They're not made to last forever. Well, the old covenant was not made to go on forever, and it told us that as the true word of God. It is our Lord Jesus who is God's final word to us. Now, I understand, of course, that... Um, most likely, if you didn't have a pretty high view of Scripture, you wouldn't be at church. I mean, that's generally who comes to church, you know. Maybe there's some exceptions. If that's the case, I'm glad. As I said, my primary purpose this morning has just been to make sure that we, we hook into the Lordship of Jesus as the basis for what we think about the nature of the Bible. But that means that ultimately... The true test of whether we revere the scriptures or not is going to be how loyal we are to Jesus Christ. It may not actually be such a surprise to you to know that after that debate I had 30 years ago, I found out that the reputation of my opponent was not exactly a morally sterling reputation. That he lived basically like what you would expect someone to live like who doesn't think the word of God is true. But that's not a great shock. Far more tragic is when those of us who claim to believe the word of God is true don't live like it. When those of us who say that we believe in the scriptures are unfaithful to the Lord Jesus it isn't enough for us to say that we believe the Bible is true. We have to live like we believe the Bible is true. As Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? So ultimately, the lesson for all of us this morning is not just to know what the Bible is, but also to be reminded of what our commitment is supposed to be. And if we can help any of you here this morning either to become a Christian or to surrender your life as a child of God to the authority of our Lord. We'd love to help you. Why don't you let us know while we stand and sing. Bring Christ your